الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء محمد المبعوث رحمة للعالمين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم صلاة وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا سيدي يا رحمة للعالمين. We thank Allah subhanahu wa taala for allowing us to come to the masjid today with the intention of studying the blessed biography and the life of the beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Alhamdulillah. Say alhamdulillah. Imam Abu Hanifa was once asked. How did you attain uh, so much knowledge? And he said, when I learnt one mas'ala, I said, Alhamdulillah. When I learnt one ruling, I thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so he gave me knowledge of more rulings. So we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this opportunity to uh, spend these moments in the majlis, the gathering, remembering the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we ask that He Almighty allows us to continue to deliver and to attend and to listen and to fill our hearts with the love of the beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Asirat al the biography of the beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For us, this is not just a, a series of historical information, uh, of uh, akhbar, of just receiving information, but rather this is for us a journey, a journey within which uh, we will travel with the beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Alhamdulillah, I can see many uh, faces who have actually studied the seerah with myself before as well. Uh, this is the fifth time I'm delivering the seerah on, on a public platform like this. And I know um, there are brothers who have studied the entire seerah with me, not just once, but twice before, and they're here again for the third time. Because this is it's not just information. You attend a course, you get information, why would you attend it again? Because there's a, a lutf, a zok, a feeling of love and a taste of a, a wajd that you feel in the gatherings of the beloved sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So it's beautiful to see so many lovers of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam who have made intention of taking out time every Sunday to come to the masjid and to join the beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on this journey. If you know how this feels, you know, and if you don't know, I'll tell you how this feels. This will feel as if you're with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam throughout this entire journey. As if you're there in the city of Makkah Al-Mukarramah when he is born. As if you're with him when he's being fostered by his foster mother Sayyidah Halima Saadiyah and you're sitting in the village of Banu Sa'ad as if you're with the Prophet ﷺ when he travels with his honorable mother Sayyida Amina to Medina Tul Munawwara. As if you're with him when he reaches Abwa to bury his honorable mother. As if you're with him ﷺ in the blessed city of Makkah Tul Mukarrama. Isn't that how it feels when you study the seerah? As if you're with him ﷺ traveling from Makkah Tul Mukarrama to Medina Tul Munawwara. Feeling every single day, every single incident that takes place on the Hijrah, the blessed migration. So this is for us to learn about the Prophet Sallallahu but also to connect with the beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A seerah, make good intentions inshallah. Okay? Any, I'm going to give you 10 intentions that we can make for studying the seerah. Okay? You may have your own intentions as well of why you're studying the seerah, why you are here. I'm going to give you uh, 10 intentions, ahdaf, motives and purposes of why we study the biography of the beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prior to that, the seerah 
studying the biography of the beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, there's not something that has just come out, you know, hundreds of years after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Studying the seerah, studying the biography of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is a practice of the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum ajma'in. The Sahaba would do this. When the Muslims of Madinah al Munawwara, they were accepting Islam. So as you'll study in the seerah, the Prophet ﷺ would uh, go for hajj. Before you know, hajj became fard for Muslims, they were performing hajj before Islam, before the time of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ, for purposes of da'wah and tabliq, bringing people to Islam, he would visit the pilgrims that would come to Mecca. And on one occasion, the Prophet ﷺ met a group of people who were from Madinah to Munawwara. And he met them, he invited them to Islam, and they accepted the message of Islam. And they returned to Medina. But the Prophet ﷺ sent with them a teacher. This was the first teacher the Prophet ﷺ sent out to teach Islam. This is the first naqib, the first ambassador of Islam the Prophet ﷺ sends. And he goes to Medina to Munawwara, he starts speaking to the people of Medina to Munawwara. A year later, over seven times more people come to perform Hajj to meet the Prophet ﷺ to accept Islam. As you're going to see, this is what you're going to be studying. What happened? What are you talking about? What happened? What happened the following year? This is what we're going to study in the seerah. But well, I'm going to mention something. The first ambassador of Islam, the first ambassador of the Prophet ﷺ, the first teacher of Islam who was sent out of Makkah al-Mukarramah to teach Islam, was a companion of the Prophet ﷺ whose name was Sayyiduna Mus'ab bin Umair radiyallahu anhu. His name was Mus'ab bin Umair radiyallahu anhu. What did he do? Because zakat is not fard at this point. Hajj is not fard at this point. Fasting Ramadan is not fard at this point. What was he doing? What was he teaching the people when he came to Medina al Munawwara? He came to Medina al Munawwara and he informed the people that a beloved messenger has been sent to the people. He was born and these were the miracles of his birth. He emerged and this is his message. These are the troubles he is uh, going through to deliver this message. The first ambassador of Islam inviting people to Islam was teaching the people of Medina al Munawwara the seerah, the biography of the Prophet so what we're doing now to study the seerah, this is a sunnah of the Sahaba and it is a sunnah of the very first teacher of Islam that the Prophet ﷺ sent out of Makkah al-Mukarramah to bring people to Islam. To teach the seerah of the beloved ﷺ. Such is its importance. Hafiz Khatib al-Baghdadi radiallahu anhu, a major scholar of hadith, he mentions a point regarding seerah. I mentioned one thing. Traditionally, the discipline, the subject of the biography of the Prophet ﷺ was not called seerah. Later on, it was called seerah. But originally, in the time of the Salaf, عنه, because within the seerah, you have many different topics. So within the biography of the Prophet ﷺ, you have many different topics. One of the Major topics, as you will see when we study the seerah, are Maghazi, the battles of the Prophet ﷺ. Originally, when the scholars and the historians of Islam, they would write down the seerah, the seerah was Maghazi. It was the battles of the Prophet ﷺ. Because the main topic of the seerah was Maghazi, the entire subject was referred to as Maghazi, the battles of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. So in the time of the Salaf, when they would study uh, the seerah and the, when the scholars wrote books on the seerah, the main subject, the main genre within the seerah was Maghazi. So this whole discipline was referred to as Maghazi, the, the military expeditions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hafiz Khatib al-Baghdadi radiallahu anhu mentions a, a narration from Muhammad ibn Abdullah 
who narrates from his uncle Imam Zuhri. Imam Zuhri is one of the major scholars of hadith. No student of hadith can be a student of hadith if he does not know the name of Imam Zuhri. So you can, Imam Zuhri is one of the main authorities in hadith. Imam Zuhri says, Fi ilm al maghazi ilm al akhirati wa dunya. In the study of maghazi, in the study of the life of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the knowledge of this world and the knowledge of the Akhirah. Specifically the military expeditions and generally the Seerah. He's saying if you want knowledge which will benefit you in dunya and knowledge which will benefit you in Akhirah, you must study the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Such is its importance. Such is the importance of studying the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of course you'll benefit in Akhirah. How are you going to benefit in dunya? Our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, within his worldly life, he has over 124,000 companions. How did that happen? Sometimes you'll hear, People saying that the companions were 124,000, that's not the case. Because the companions who performed Hajj with the Prophet ﷺ were 124,000. So they have far more companions. How did that happen? What was it in the Prophet ﷺ that made the likes of the desert dwellers of Arabia fight the superpowers of the world? Not only fight them, defeat them, conquer them, and take over their lands. Sayyiduna Ali ibn al Hussein bin Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in. Sayyiduna Zainul Abidin Sajjad radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, Kunna nu'allimu maghazi al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sarayahu. The great grandson of the Prophet وسلم, the son of Imam Hussein, Sayyidina Ali, more commonly known as Zainul Abidin Sajjad, radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, We would study Maghazi and Nabi, the military expeditions of the Prophet وسلم, and as you know, this applies generally to the seerah. We would study specifically the military expeditions and generally the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Quran, the way we would study a chapter from the Noble Quran. Such was the importance laid on the seerah. Such was the importance placed on studying the biography of the beloved Prophet Sallallahu in the family of the Prophet Sallallahu that they would give it such importance, the way they would go out of their way and study the chapters of the Qur'an, they would prepare and do ihtimam and go out of their way to study the seerah of the beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We will now cover the 10 reasons, wisdoms for studying the seerah, the biography of the beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These are 10 that will mention, of course there are many more, as you progress in your studies, you will find more. Uh, consider these as wisdoms, uh, intentions, reasons, goals and purposes of our study of the seerah of the beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The first of them is to connect with the Qur'an. The first of them is to connect with the Qur'an. The Qur'an was given to us, not directly, the Qur'an was given to us bi wasitati Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Qur'an came to us through the beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What does that teach you? The Qur'an has come to us through the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you want to connect back to the Qur'an, you must go back through the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Don't compare the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to some worldly postman. This is what some people do, na'udhu billah. They say the 
The postman comes and delivers the message. You take the message and read it. You're not going to speak to the postman. Na'udhu billah. I've heard people say this when they speak about the Prophet ﷺ. That he's brought the message of the Qur'an. You take the Qur'an and that's it. His message is done. He was just a messenger of Allah. That's all. Did the Sahaba not know that? Did the Sahaba not know that? We're going to see how the Sahaba treated the Prophet ﷺ when you study the seerah. We will see how the Sahaba treated the Beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that's how we're going to behave. We don't need any teachers from the 21st century to tell us how we should behave with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're going directly to the Sahaba and we're going to look at how the Sahaba behaved with the Beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that's how we're going to do. Those are our uh, role models of how we behave with our beloved sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So the first is for us to connect with the book of Allah. We must connect to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. It is not possible, it is not possible to connect with the book of Allah without connecting with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And that is in multiple ways. I'm, I'm going to explain this as we go along. So the first reason for us to study the seerah is for us to connect with the Quran. We must study the seerah. Number two, <coughs> the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the proof of the Qur'an, is the proof of Islam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's Hayat Mubarakah, his blessed life, Sirah Sharifa, is the proof of Islam, is the proof of the Noble Qur'an. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam presented this himself. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was instructed to announce his prophethood to his tribe, to the people of Mecca and to invite them to Islam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's uh, stages of inviting to Islam were three stages which we're going to cover. The second stage was call all of your tribes men. So in the city of Makkatul Mukarrama, the Prophet ﷺ stands at Mount Safa and he calls all of his uh, tribe, his clan, the Quraysh. He gathers them at the foot of the mountain. What does he say? He ﷺ says to them, if I was to tell you that there is an army on the other side of this mountain ready to attack you, would you believe me? You've got no other information. You have no other means of receiving this information. You've, you've got, you're not in a battle with any huge army, any huge tribe or clan. No one sent a message to you. You can't hear anything. You have no information except for me. And I was to tell you that there is an army on the other side of this mountain. Would you believe me? And all of them replied, yes, we would believe you. You are a sadiq al-ameen. You are a sadiq, the truthful. You are ameen, the trustworthy. Of course, we would believe you. So what did he present? What did the Prophet ﷺ present as a proof for him being the messenger, proof for the Quran being the book of Allah, proof for Islam? He presented himself. He presented himself. I've been living with you for 40 years. My birth was with you. You witnessed the miracles of my birth. My childhood was with you. You witnessed the miracles of my childhood. My youth was with you. You witnessed the miracles of my youth. My adulthood was with you. You witnessed the miracles of my adulthood. For 40 years you've seen me. For 40 years you've witnessed my life. That is a proof of Islam. I've even heard someone saying that when you study the seerah, you should study it after the age of 40. I've heard speakers saying this. When you study the seerah of the Prophet Wasallam, you should study it after the age of 40. What's wrong? Because they know that when you start the seerah, you have to start at the birth of the Prophet It's simple as that. You cannot study the seerah without studying the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, which is filled with miracles. 
Imam Nasiruddin al Dimishqi has a seven volume, one of the great scholars of Damascus, seven volume book just on the miracles that occurred at the birth of the Prophet. Sayyiduna Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib accepted Islam. And the Prophet asked him, What made you accept Islam? And he says, Well, I saw you when you were in your cradle. And whenever, wherever you would point your finger, the moon would fall that way. So is it not important to study his blessed life before the age of 40? He himself sallallahu alayhi wasallam is presenting those 40 years as a proof of him being the Prophet. What was he presenting? Let's study it. What was he presenting sallallahu alayhi wasallam? Let's study that. When Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq was asked, why did you accept Islam? He will tell you, he spent those 40 years with the Prophet sallallahu grew up with the Prophet sallallahu done business with the Prophet sallallahu He is the best friend of the Prophet sallallahu He traveled on a business trip before the Prophet sallallahu announced prophethood. Before the Prophet sallallahu announced prophethood, he already knew that he's a prophet before the age of 40. Sayyidina Usman radiallahu anhu, each of the companions, the major companions, before the emergence of the Prophet sallallahu they were given khabar by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in forms of different incidents that he is Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the second reason for us to study the seerah is to understand what did the Prophet sallallahu mean when he's saying, I've lived with you for 40 years. That is the proof of Islam. So let's study that insha'Allah. The third reason to study the seerah is to understand the Qur'an. Is to understand the noble Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the noble Qur'an says, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Chapter 16, verse 44. وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرِ And we have revealed to you, meaning the Prophet ﷺ, a dhikr, the remembrance. This refers to the Qur'an. We have revealed to you the Qur'an. لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ So that you may explain to people what was revealed to them. وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ And perhaps they will become people of reflection and understanding. To understand the Qur'an, we must look to the Prophet The explanation of the Qur'an is from the Prophet by his words and by his actions. When you study the seerah, you will see how the Prophet is teaching the verse of the Qur'an. How the Prophet is showing his noble companions radiallahu anhum ajma'een to implement the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sahaba would come to the Prophet and they would ask for explanation of certain verses. Certain verses the Prophet would not explain certain verses, meaning he would leave them unconditional. And other verses the Prophet would explain in his wording. And other uh, ayat, verse of the Quran, the Prophet would explain in his actions. So, not only to connect with the Qur'an, not only to understand the Qur'an is a book of Allah, but to understand the Qur'an, we must understand the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To understand the Qur'an, we must understand the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know when you study the Qur'an, there are so many disciplines. This verse was revealed at this incident. If you don't know the seerah, how are you going to know that? This verse was revealed, these sets of verses were revealed, this chapter was revealed when this happened. But if you don't know the seerah, you won't be able to understand that. To understand the context of the chapters of the Noble Qur'an, we must understand the seerah of the beloved Prophet wasallam. And the Prophet wasallam is, is there any authority above the Prophet wasallam to explain the Qur'an after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It is the Prophet wasallam. So for us to understand the Qur'an, we must study the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Reason number four, reason number four is to understand the chronology, the order of the Noble Qur'an 
and the order of the hadith of the Prophet to have this timeline in our minds. Once you have this timeline in your mind, that the age of, for example, at the age of 40, the Prophet began to receive revelation. He remained in Mecca al Mukarramah till the age of 53, migrated to Medina al Munawwara, and lived there physically till the age of 63. These are the main events in the city of Mecca. These are the main events in the city of Medina. Once this is in your mind, now when you study the Quran and you hear that the Prophet said this at the occasion of the Hajj, you know where that's placed. You know the timeline. Okay, so this is placed at this point here. Okay, so the Prophet uh, when he reached Medina al Munawwara within the first year, these are some of the commands that came. These are some of the verses that were revealed. You know where to place this. This will allow you to, the, studying the seerah will allow you to understand the timeline of the Quran and the timeline of the words of the Prophet ﷺ. If you do not understand this, you will not know the order of the verses of the Quran. You will not know the order of the words of the Prophet ﷺ. You have hadith where the Prophet ﷺ is prohibiting Sahaba from going to the grave. Then you have other hadith where the Prophet ﷺ is encouraging Sahaba to go to the graveyards. If you don't understand the order and the context of the seerah, you will not know which is placed where and what is the ruling. You have verses of the Quran that are revealed discouraging alcohol, khamar. Not saying it's haram, discouraging it. It's not good for you. But then you have other verses that are clearly saying alcohol, khamar is haram. If you do not understand the the timeline of the Quran and the Sunnah, you do not know where to place them, you will not be able to understand properly. So studying the seerah will help you immensely. Whichever Islamic uh, subject you study will help you. You study the biography of Sahaba, you come across, across a Sahabi and it says, this Sahabi is Ansari. And you're like, you've probably heard that, you know, and you read the name of a Sahabi and at the end of his name it says Ansari. What does that mean? The seerah will help you to understand what that means. You see the name of a Sahabi and at the end of the name it says he's Badri. Or in the biography it says this is a Badri Sahabi. What does that mean? You study the biography of another companion it says he was in the first pledge of allegiance. He was in the second pledge of allegiance. What does all of this mean? When you study the seerah it will allow you to understand the timeline of Islam. Reason number five, reason number five, I think this is the reason why all of you have come here. Reason number five. Reason number five is to know the Prophet ﷺ. To know the beloved Prophet ﷺ. To recognize Sayyidul Anbiya wal Mursaleen ﷺ. I have been saying my whole life, La ilaha illallah. Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is none worthy of worship except Allah. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. Imagine someone asks you, uh, can you tell me? So this person, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who's so important to you that just saying his name once will take you to Jannah. Isn't that the case? If somebody says, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah, their entire life and has not said Muhammadur Rasulullah, has not testified Muhammadur Rasulullah, has that person died on Iman? No. Will that person enter Jannah? No. But that man, that woman, just once says Muhammadur Rasulullah and dies on that state, will they enter Jannah? Yes. We judge by outward. So, oh Muslim, this person, this personality, sallallahu alayhi wa is so important to you that to say his name once will take you to Jannah. Tell me about him. What can you say about him? What can we tell the person who's asking us this question about this person who is so beloved to us that we are ready to give our lives for him? We are ready to ransom our lives for him. If the question was asked, 
then we would say yes. If I was asked to give up my breaths for him, I will give them all up. If I was asked to give up the beats of my heart for him, I will give them all up. That's how beloved he is to me. Okay, O oh Muslim, he is that beloved to you. So tell me about him. It would be a shame if all that we could not say much about him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he is the most beloved of Allah's creation to us. To recognize him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we must study his seerah. We must study his seerah to recognize him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The more you recognize him, the stronger your iman will become. When the Prophet ﷺ, you know we are far away from the Prophet ﷺ in time. In time we're very far away from the Prophet ﷺ. But we can still be close to the Prophet ﷺ spiritually. We might be 1400 years away from his blessed time. But remember, every time is a time of our beloved. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We might be five, six thousand miles away physically from his blessed resting place. But O Muslims, you are blessed. Because for you time is no restriction and place is no restriction. You can be close to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam whilst being fourteen hundred years after his time, and whilst being five, six, seven, eight thousand miles away from him, you can still be close to him by studying his blessed life, by studying the life of the beloved sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You know, in the in the grave, there are three questions. There are three questions in the grave. Who is your Lord? What is your religion? What did you used to say about this person? As I mentioned in authentic Sahih Hadith. These are the three questions of the grave. If a person answers the first question correctly, Who is your Lord? Rabbi Allah. My Lord is Allah. Have they passed the test? They haven't passed the test. You've got two more questions. Madinuk, what's your religion? Deen il Islam. My religion is Islam. They've answered both questions correctly. Have they passed the test? They've not passed the test. What does that show you? There's that one question which is so important. It's so important, it's the only question Imam Bukhari mentions. The one question which will determine whether this person has been successful in their 50, 60, 70 years of their worldly life. That one question which will determine whether this person will be successful in the grave. That one question which will determine whether the grave is a garden of Jannah or a pit of hell. That one question which will determine whether you will be in tranquility until the day of judgment or punishment. That one question which will determine whether you rise on the day of judgment with the believers or the disbelievers. That one question which will determine whether you enter paradise or Jahannam hell is, O oh person, tell me what did you used to say about this man? What did you used to say about him? This person who made no connection with the beloved in the world, sent no salawat upon him, did not know what he looked like, knew nothing about his life. How will such a person be able to answer this question? But then imagine the one who every day would send prayers of peace and blessings upon him. Would study his description and knew what his blessed eyes looked like. Knew what his eyebrows looked like. Knew what his complexion was like. Knew what his blessed beard was like. Knew that for 40 years, this is how he lived in the city of Makkah al-Mukarramah. For 23 years, he received the Quran. And these are the difficulties and the tribulations he underwent. For 20, the 13 years in Makkah al-Mukarramah, this was his life. The 10 years in Madinah al munawwara this was his life. And for 1400 years, this person is a part 
of that lineage of those who would love the beloved. When he is asked, when she is asked in the grave, what did you used to say about this person? Imagine the replies that will come out of this mouth. Imagine the replies of this person who spent their entire life answering uh, and spent their entire life making a connection with the Prophet ﷺ. So the fifth reason for us to study the seerah is to recognize the beloved Prophet ﷺ. You know, each of these points, I have so many more points. Like with one point, I want to add so much more. But there's a time restraint. Plus, for Karyan, you might not turn up next time. The sixth reason, the sixth reason to study the seerah is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Noble Quran has told us the best example is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ Hasana, Uswatun Hasana, the best example is the, is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has told us. So then what do we do? We know he's the best example Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what do we do with that knowledge? We study his life. How was he the best example for us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? We study the private life of the Prophet ﷺ and the public life of the Prophet ﷺ. We all have that, don't we? When we're behind, we're in our house, that's our private life. We learn that from this, the seerah, the private life of the Prophet ﷺ. Then the public life of the Prophet ﷺ. The familial life, the societal life of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ was a child to his parents to his foster parents. The Prophet ﷺ was a husband. The Prophet ﷺ was a parent. The Prophet ﷺ was a grandparent. Are you not one of those things? Everyone here is one of those. The Prophet ﷺ was a friend. The Prophet ﷺ was a leader. The Prophet ﷺ conducted business. The Prophet ﷺ was in all aspects of life we take from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But how can we do that if we do not study the seerah? So that is the sixth reason. Because he is the best example. So let's study his life. Let's study his life. And then we're not just studying his life, we're implementing that into our lives. One Ramadan, I made intention of doing a full recitation of a book of, is a book of hadith called Shifa, a Shifa of Qadi Iyad. And I thought, this year I'm going to read this whole book in Ramadan. So I sat in that corner over there and I was reading this book. And I thought, no one's going to disturb me now. And we've got 30 days, I need to finish this book of hadith. So I'm sitting there, I'm reading, reading, reading. And I come across beautiful narrations, beautiful narrations. And after Salat al-Zuhr, this was in the summer, so after Salat al-Zuhr to Asr, you have good five hours stretch. That was good, I got five hours with no one to disturb me. After Zuhr, I locked the door, locked that door, signed that corner to read my book. And there's a, a, a it's outside of Salat, I mean, it's obviously Salat time, but it's outside of a conventional, you know, somebody pops up for Salat. The brother comes to a window, starts knocking the door, not knocking the window. I look, I'm, I'm thinking he can't see me, so he doesn't know I'm here. Don't have to open the door. This, so then I'm just sitting there, I'm like, it's okay, you know, he can't see me, I'm not gonna open the door. I'm reading my book. I'm not the Imam of the Masjid. I'm just sitting in the corner reading my book. If I was the Imam, it'd be my job to open the door. So he keeps knocking, then I think to myself, you know what? I just, I'm reading the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu And I literally just read the narration, there's a narration where a, a mentally ill Sahabiya, mentally ill companion of the Prophet ﷺ, she comes to the Prophet ﷺ in the streets of Medina. She says, I need your help. You know what the Prophet ﷺ says to her? The Prophet ﷺ says to her, sit down, I must sit with you. I'm not going to get up until I've helped you. Sit down anywhere, sit down wherever you want. I'm going to sit with you and I will not leave you until I've helped you. I'd read that that very same day. 
and thought to myself, you know what, if I finish this entire book and this person has left without me helping him, I'm not going to be satisfied. So now I open the door and uh, he sits with me for six hours. <laughs> I thought, Alhamdulillah, I've acted upon the sunnah now. I did not finish the book that Ramadan because I thought to myself, if I finish this book and I've not implemented this and I'm cutting myself off from everyone to finish the book, it'll defeat the purpose of studying the biography of the Prophet Wasallam. So for us, it's not just information. He is the best example. When we learn, look, we learn from our community, the way we conduct our weddings. We learn that from our community, the way we conduct our households. We learn that from our community. You know when Sultan Salahuddin al-Ayyubi rahimahullah ta'ala after the Crusaders took over Bayt al-Muqaddas, Jerusalem, Sultan Salahuddin al-Ayyubi rahimahullah ta'ala, he took his army and waged war against the Crusaders. And on the 17th attempt, he took over Bayt al-Muqaddas. 16 times he attacked the Crusaders to take over the land and he failed. The 17th time he came, and he took over the land. When he took over the land, he defeated the Crusaders, the heads, the commanders, the generals of the Crusaders were then brought forward in his court. And they were expecting uh, for death. They were expecting that now the Sultan will uh, give us the death penalty. Sultan Salahuddin Al-Ayyubi Ta'ala then said to them, you are free to go. You have been freed. Your children are free, your women are free, your elderly, but not just them, even your men. They are free to go, leave Bayt al-Muqaddas without any further harm. Hearing this, the commanders of the uh, crusaders were shocked. And they said that, is this real? Will this actually happen? Because when we came and we took over Jerusalem, we killed everyone. We killed the children, the women, the elderly. We did not spare anyone. And Sultan Salahuddin al-Ayyubi rahimahullah ta'ala then said to them, Well, you are not my teachers. My teacher is Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So as believers, we will always and we should always look back at our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his teachings and apply his teachings to our lives. Our teacher is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let's study the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let's see what he taught us in his life. Let's see why he taught the Sahaba Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhum Ajma'een and then implement that into our lives. One example, in our, uh, just a, a, a random example has come to mind. We don't know in our communities, I've been conducting nikahs for some time. I don't conduct nikahs often. I, I, I don't like the environment. But I've seen two extremes. Either we go over the top or we're very stingy. One of the two. That's what the situation is. Not in the middle. We go over the top to the degree where, you know, we, we enter a large debt. Hire out helicopters, throw money and everything. Or we're on the other side where it's like, you know what, let's just do the nikah and forget the walima. So both extremes. The Prophet ﷺ told us to be in the middle. Don't be on either extremes. So you know sometimes like you'll hear imams saying, don't be extravagant. But they forget, don't be stingy as well. <laughs> Once the Prophet ﷺ was sitting and one of the companions was sitting with the Prophet ﷺ. Remember... The Prophet ﷺ clothes, they were patched. Yes? The Prophet ﷺ blessed clothes, they were patched. The companion sitting with the Prophet ﷺ, he's wearing patched clothes. The Prophet ﷺ looks at, at him and says, how's business? He says, it's really good. <laughs> business is really good. So everything's going well, you're making a lot of money, alhamdulillah. The Prophet ﷺ says, why don't you show Allah's blessings in your clothes? <laughs> Show Allah's blessings in your clothes. 
The Prophet ﷺ left dunya. He left dunya. The Prophet ﷺ, if he wanted, he could have mountains of gold walking with him. He left it himself. But he's saying to his companion, who's wearing patch clothes, the way he's wearing patch clothes, wear proper clothes. Okay, I don't want to get into a habit of going into Patwari, Mirpuri, but wear proper clothes. The Prophet ﷺ is teaching his Sahaba, but he's not just teaching that Sahabi, this is the barakah of the Prophet ﷺ, he's teaching all of us. He's teaching all of us. Don't just think that he's telling that one Sahabi in year 600, uh, 600 uh, CE. He's telling all of his Ummah, if Allah gives you a blessing, show it in your clothes. He's teaching all of us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The best example, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the best example. How do you speak to people? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam done da'wah. Those of you who are in da'wah field, want to give da'wah, want to invite people to the deen, look at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A companion came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I want to give all of my wealth to Allah. Prophet said, give less. He says, I'm going to give half of my, uh, three quarters of my wealth to Allah. The Prophet said, give less. He says, half, less. Third, okay, that's fine. Then Abu Bakr Siddiq comes, he says, Ya Rasulullah I'm going to give everything for Allah. The Prophet says, kabool it, accept it, give it all. How did that happen? The Prophet is teaching us the rules of how to deal with people in the community. Sayyiduna Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, his Iman was on that level that he could give everything and his Iman would still be firm in his heart. Whereas the other companion, his Iman was a good Iman, not on that level. He would give everything, then he think, make a gita. He think, what button? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is teaching us in his blessed life. This is our role model. We learn who's our teacher? Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Bu'ithtu mu'alliman, I have been sent. Inna ma bu'ithtu mu'alliman, I have been sent as a teacher. Oh students, where are you? Ya Rasulullah, we have come. We're here now to learn from our beautiful teacher Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why we're here. Number seven, the seventh reason of studying the sea. Is he extremely intelligent? He is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When you study the seerah, you will see it. You will see he is Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is not just somebody who's been assisted with intelligence. He is granted divine revelation and divine assistance. You may see his intelligence sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the battles when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructing sahaba you stand over here, do not come down you look after the back, you do this he's setting up his battalion showing his supreme intelligence but don't forget he also took the, the branch from the tree and turned it into a sword don't forget that as well don't forget that he took a branch made a cross on the floor and said tomorrow this kafir, he's going to die here. He made another cross and said, that kafir, he's going to die here. Yes, he is the most intelligent of mankind, but he is Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Do not belittle his status by calling him the genius, the intelligent, the most intelligent. Don't belittle his status by saying that. He is the one who received divine assistance. He is the one who received revelation from Allah. He is Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The eighth reason to study the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number one is to recognize, we mentioned that, but number, number five, but number eight is the more you study him, the more you will love him. The more you study the life of the Prophet wasallam, the more you will love the Prophet wasallam. The more you learn about his description, the more you learn about his life, the more you learn his words, the more you learn, the more you will love him. That's natural. That's our reason, reason number eight, is that this will create more and more love in our hearts for our beloved sallallahu alayhi wasallam. 
What did Sayyiduna Ali say in his hadith of Hilya right at the end? Man ra'ahu badihatan habahu. The one who ever, the one who saw the Prophet ﷺ suddenly, habahu, would be awestruck. The one who would see the Prophet ﷺ just immediately without being acquainted, habahu, would be struck with awe. Sahabia came into Masjid Nabwi. She saw the Prophet ﷺ sitting with his arms wrapped around his legs and she began to tremble out of the awe of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Sakina alaykil Sakina. Ya miskina alayki sakina. O poor woman, be peaceful. O miskina, have sakina. O poor woman, have sakina, have sukoon. I'm only Allah's servant. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The one who saw him immediately, suddenly, without acquaintance, would be awestruck. Waman khalatahu ma'rifatan ahabbahu. The one who would get to know him would fall in love with him. Let's get to know him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The more you study his life, the more you will fall in love with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A question was asked, how did the Sahaba reach that level of love? Because Sahaba had different degrees as well. How did they reach a level of love that when they hear that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has left the world, Sahabi is making dua, Ya Allah, if my beloved has left the world and take away my eyes. How did they reach that level of love? Because of their company with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But O oh Muslim, do not lose hope. These are the gatherings where you will be in the company of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you will increase us in our love. When khalatahu ma'rifatan ahabbahu Sayyiduna Amirul Mu'mineen Ali bin Abi Talib said, the one who gets to know him will only and only fall in love with him. Let's fall in love with the one who is worthy of that love. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number eight. Wait, that was number eight. Number nine. The love of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam creates revolutionary people. The love of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam completely changes the people. It will change you as a person. All the good qualities that you want. You want to control your anger. You want to be a calm person, you want to be a person who thinks ahead, you want to be a planned person, you want to be an active person, you want to be a smart person, whatever you want, the underlying attribute is the love of the Prophet I can prove that, we don't have time now. The love of the Prophet and studying the life of the Prophet will create revolutionary people. Look at the Sahaba. Amir al Mu'mineen, Umar ibn al Khattab, radiallahu anhu, fights the Persians, conquers the Persians, who have been ruling the world for thousands of years. Umar ibn al Khattab takes on the Romans, fights the Romans, defeats the Romans, conquers their land, enters the palace of the Persian emperor, and the Persians have pride over their carpets. He says, bring the horses in, let them sit here. Takes the bangles, puts them on the hands of Suraka, which is another narration we're going to cover. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he sends his army to Baytul Muqaddas to conquer Baytul Muqaddas, Jerusalem, how is he walking? He's, he's on his horse, in one narration he reaches Najran, and the Christians of Najran see him and when they look at him, they're like, this is the person who's been described in our scriptures, that a man will come looking exactly like this, and he will conquer Baytul Muqaddas. Once he's crying, Amir al muminin Umar ibn al-Khattab, the historians say, if he lived for 10 more years, he would have conquered the whole world. He's crying one day and he says, I am that very same Umar, that once he lost his sheep and his father beat him up. Because that's me. I couldn't handle sheep, and now I'm ruling the world. Now I'm ruling the world. That revolution, this is the same Umar radiallahu anhu, who came with a sword to martyr the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Tabaqat of Ibn Sa'ad, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, this Umar is that Umar, when he walks down one street, shaitan walks down the other street. 
How did this happen? Because of the revolution the Prophet ﷺ caused in their hearts. If you just look at Sahaba, there are so many examples that we have in the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een. In the occasion of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, which we'll cover, Urwa bin Mas'ud comes. <laughs> First time a kafir of Mecca has seen the Prophet ﷺ without intention of war. What does he see? He sees that the Prophet ﷺ is seated here and he sees another companion who's got a helmet on standing there with a the sword. And it's, it's a beautiful long narration. There's a whole dars when we get to it. Treaty of Hudaybiyah usually takes two, three lessons. Urwa bin Mas'ud touches the beard of the Prophet ﷺ because this is a habit of the Arabs. It's a habit of the Arabs when they speak, they'll grab a limb or they touch a beard. He touches the beard of the Prophet ﷺ. The Sahabi who's standing there with his sword takes the back of his sword, smacks his hand. Says, Move your hand. Who do you think you're touching? Move your hand. <laughs> Urwa bin Mas'ud looks at him and says, Who are you? He lifts up his helmet. He's one of the slaves of Makkah al Mukarrama. Urwa bin Mas'ud is shocked. He's saying, we've spent years breaking their souls, making them into slaves, treading on them under our feet. They are worse than animals. But you've taken these people who we made worse than animals and placed them and made them into the stars of the skies. This revolution was caused by the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Any good quality you want, study the seerah of the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, it's possible for many problems to go away with one solution. Mufti Ahmad Yar Khan Naimi mentions this. He says that there was an old man once, he came to a doctor. Old man came to a doctor and he says to the doctor, you know, my, my knees are hurting. My knees are hurting. Doctor says, there's old age. It was okay. He says, my eyesight's become weak. Doctor says, that's old age. He says, my hearing's gone weak. <laughs> Doctor says, old age. He says, my back's hurting. It's old age. Bazur Bawa Sahib gets really angry. Is he angry? He says, my feet are hurting too. Doctor says, it's old age. He gets angry. He goes, have you studied anything else than an old age? <laughs> yeah, have you studied anything else? Have you just studied old age? Doctor says, you know, Haji Sahib, uncle, you know you're getting angry. It's also old age. <laughs> It's possible for there to be many problems that are caused by one root problem. We have many problems in our families, in our communities, in our wider communities, in the Ummah. If we connect to the Prophet ﷺ, these problems will go away. As a family, connect to the Prophet ﷺ, your familial problems will go away. As a clan, connect to the Prophet ﷺ. As a community, connect to the Prophet ﷺ, these problems will go away. And the final reason from our reasons the tenth reason to study the seerah is to recognize the great bounty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted us and ni'matul uzma the greatest blessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us to recognize that blessing and when you recognize that blessing then to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that blessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the believers a blessing by sending to them a messenger. So let's recognize this blessing. Let's understand what is this blessing and then thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this blessing. Inshallah in our next session we will um, start the study of the seerah. Next lesson, we'll speak about the world in the time the Prophet ﷺ came. So in the, the northern side, uh, northeastern side, you had the Persian Empire. Northwest side, you had the Romans. Um, further towards the west, you had the Abyssinians. So we're going to be studying the empires, the, the people, the cultures, the religions that were there at the time. And then if you have time, we'll study specifically the Arabs. And one big question, why was the Prophet ﷺ sent specifically in the Arabs? And then he emerged from the Arabs. There are reasons for that. We're going to cover that inshaAllah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.